Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm going to record this meeting because uh, some of our church members requested. Uh -huh. Yeah, they wanted to make it, but they couldn't, so they want to just hear. So. Um, I was kind of stuck on verse 14 mm -hmm. because... Okay, so it says, because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Um, that logical progression didn't make sense to me, right? So contempt for the Lord is like hating God, right? Mm -hmm. So David, um, I mean, I don't think when he did the sin he did it from like hating god or mm. from at least from like what i would think from a human perspective is to hate someone which mm. is like feeling angry at god or something like that right mm. um but i also understand like loving god is different from like feeling affection or it's not just feeling affection for God. This also just has to do with following his command. Mm. So I can see how contempt for God is just synonymous with sinning. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I, I think there's still something more than just like being a replacement word. But anyway, mm. it, it didn't make sense to me. Why should the son born to you die? Because you've shown hatred to God. Um, but I mean, if I understand this as, I mean, the son being like the only thing that it made me think about was, I mean, the son is obviously a type of Christ mm -hmm. and the innocent who dies. And like, the impression that I got was it's just like this judgment is God saying you got what you wished for because you hated this. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's the correct way of interpreting it, but then, you know, for ourselves or for myself personally, mm. like reflecting on my sin, mm. knowing that that is, what kills Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And makes him suffer. That's mm -hmm. kind of when I read this, that's what I that's the message I get. That mm -hmm. you got what you wish for, and this innocent person you hated, so you die. So he's gonna die. Because mm -hmm. that's what you know. And yeah, that that kind of makes me feel much more like contrition. Mm -hmm yeah okay yep that's a good uh comment line i think you gave a really good answer to also eunice's question uh through that verse definitely i also do believe this is a type of uh, christ uh, just like how this child was innocent separated from sins and did not know any of sins um he was not even involved in, in any sinful activities just like how jesus was he was sinless um, he was apart from sins. Uh, he was innocent. But then still, Jesus died for us um, because of our sins, right? Just like how this child died because of his dead sins. Uh, so definitely I see there's a strong tie that God is trying to tell David. But this doesn't mean that like God wanted to kill a child, right? Because later we see how God blessed David with even a better child, his name was Solomon, uh, in replacement of the son that was died, right? So the Bible says in the later in the in the later part of the chapter that David was so much comforted by the presence of his new child, um, who was given as a replacement of his previous child as a product of his sins. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe we'll come to a more understanding of the verse because we definitely see here how the letter goes, how the verse goes. You have shown utter contempt for the Lord, 
uh, the son born to you will die. Contempt for the Lord is understood in a very, uh, uh, from the perspective of great controversy, right? How does our sin show contempt for the Lord? How does that look like, right? So when we are, or when we come to understand this entire thing of the great controversy, uh, we'll, I think we'll come to a full understanding of uh, the David's real sin and how that show utter contempt, utter contempt uh, for the Lord and why the son had to die. But for now, I agree, uh, it was definitely the type of Christ. Uh, and definitely maybe David saw something through this experience, right? How because of his sins, Jesus had to die in the future, Messiah had to come and things like that. So. Uh, Philip, you want to share your insights? Any questions that you may have or anything you want to share? Sure. Um, yeah, I was definitely, I also had the same similar thoughts as uh, Lion and Eunice. Um, but before we read it, you said that we should have a focus on forgiveness, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, in the first line of verse 13, uh, I, you can kind of see, like, from David's per perspective, I think he's kind of asking for forgiveness because he realized that he has sinned against the Lord. Um, that's what I kind of got from that, I guess. Um, I was kind of confused at verse 15, um, just, I guess, because, like, I don't know, my knowledge of the Bible is kind of minimal. Um, so I, I, wasn't really, I wasn't really sure who Uriah was. Um, mm. Yeah, but that, that's about it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's good, that's good. Uh, definitely, I think you stick to the point of forgiveness, uh, which verse 13 definitely says. Um, I'll be explaining a little more about that part uh, on the slides that I prepared. Uh, for the question you had on verse 15 about Uriah, Uriah was actually the soldier of David. Uh, she was a Hittite, that's what the Bible says. So he was not a pure Jew. He was a Hittite. It seems like during David's time or during those ancient times, they try to hire or employ um, some of the good soldiers from different tribes or different race or something like that. So the Bible says that Uriah was a Hittite. Um, and definitely he was a very faithful man. He was a very faithful man. But while he was at war, uh, fighting against his enemies, David committed his wife. And to cover up his sins, uh, David indirectly killed Uriah uh, in the war. So that's what the Bible says about Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. What is very interesting is Bible never mentions Bathsheba as David's wife or uh, the wife. It always says Uriah's wife. So it is very straight to the point, like David did what he was not supposed to do. Like he's not, she's not David's wife, Uriah's wife. Um, that's a very interesting expression there. So yeah. So what are you going to say? I don't know, nothing. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so uh, I'll share about a brief Slides. I'll share the slides here. Let me share the screen. Okay, now you'll be able to see the slides. Okay, so let me briefly share about uh, the topic of forgiveness here. So we see here how David sinned, and the story of his sinning appears in chapter 11. And then right after chapter 11 comes chapter 12. And that's what we just read tonight, right? So because we just, as readers, we just read verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we don't really see the time elapse, right? But when we specifically research between 11, which is after David's sin, and 12, which is when Nathan came, uh, there was a year of gap. So which means that David sinned, and then he spent a year uh, which is a pretty long time, in my opinion. And then Nathan came to point out David's sin. So those a year period of time, 
one year of time, David spent just like a usual man, right, at the palace. He had a party, maybe. He was living very well. Uh, it seems like everything was normal, normal, right, even after his sins. But when he repented to the prophets, what it says there is that David still was filled with guilt of his sins. So it seems like everything was well. He was having part in, uh, and uh, all the normal things, you know, as if nothing has happened. But as a matter of fact, he was suffering from the guilt of his sins. And he writes that in one of the Psalms that he wrote in the book of Psalms, that his heart was destroyed. His heart was dying uh, when he did not confess his sins. So he's writing that. Uh, of his experience of of, of, of that one year uh, when he just did not confess his sins, right? So here's the thing. When Nathan said, going back to the verse, when Nathan said, the Lord had forgiven your sin, and David said, I have sinned against the Lord, right? The sin that David said and the sin that Nathan said is different. It is because when David said sin, he was talking about the sin that he committed against Bathsheba and Uriah. But when Nathan said, the Lord has forgiven your sin, that sin in Hebrew word is not what David meant as sin, but it was the result of sins. In the Hebrew word, they use different word of sins, right? So what is the result of David's sin? Definitely David was supposed to die, right? Because according to their law written in Leviticus, Everyone who committed murder, everyone who committed adultery should be stoned and put to death, right? But when Nathan said, your sin is forgiven, the Lord has passed over your sins, just like how passed over during Exodus, um, the death of David, the result of sin was passed over, was forgiven, right? And this is not only involving the death as a result of his sins, but it, this also involves the guilt of David's sin, because God knew that David was suffering from his sins uh, as a result of his sins, right? So again, let me tell you this. The result of sin is not only that, but the result of sin is also guilt. That's the nature of sin. Sin may be one-time experience. We just sin once and done, but guilt is forever. That's a nature of sins. That is why we have to strive ourselves not to get involved in any sinful activities because sinful activity itself is not killing us. It's the guilt after we sin that really kills us, right? Because there's a result of sin. So when Nathan said God has forgave, forgiven your sins, the result of sins, it was not only death that was forgiven, but also the guilt that God wanted to forgive and want to solve, which I think uh, was the mercy of God. God knew exactly what David was going, going through, right? And here, what we see here is that forgiveness was given as a result of transfer of his sins, right? God said, you're forgiven, but the result of the sin, the death, was not completely erased. It was transferred to his son, right? So forgiveness um, is not given as, or let me rephrase that. Forgiveness was not randomly given to us. It was given as a result of transferring the result of our sins to someone. Uh, and that is Jesus. That's how the forgiveness was given to us. Right? There was a big sacrifice of the son of David just like how there was a big sacrifice of the Son of God. Uh, Psalms 51, David writes about this experience, and he says that, which is a very interesting verse. David says, as he confesses his sins, as he repents his sins, David says, against you, God, you only have I sinned, is what David says. Um, there's something really weird about this verse, don't you think so? Against you, you only have I sinned. What is David saying here, right? Because David sinned against at least, how many people? At least two people. Number one, Uriah. Number two, Bathsheba. And then if we try to extend that, extend the influence of his sins, he, he also sinned against to their families, right? Uriah's families. 
Bathsheba's parents, maybe, oh, things like that, right? But David is saying that he only sinned against God. Does that mean that David did not really realize his sins against other people? The answer is certainly no, right? David is trying to say this to emphasize how much that his sins gave pain to God first and then gave pain to the others. So David, after this experience, David began to see uh, the nature of sins. Whatever he sinned, whatever the sinners sin, um, do not only influence human being, but primarily it influences God himself. Everything that we sin against human is sin against God. There is a good reason why we shouldn't sin against human as well. Um, and here's the thing, let me read that. After receiving forgiveness, he sought for forgiveness to the people he had done wrong. Uh, this is a very important, very important lesson of forgiveness. After he received forgiveness from God, he sought for forgiveness to the people that he had done wrong. One of the reasons why David did not go against his son, right? It is because he sought forgiveness from the entire house of Bathsheba. Uh, and David's son's advisor was Bathsheba's grandfather. David does not want to go against their house once again, right? Because he sought for forgiveness. So he pretended himself that he was losing the war. <laughs> Even though he was a warrior, he knew how to fight. For that reason, because he sought for forgiveness to the people that he had done wrong. And this is the power of Christianity. Uh, the power of Christianity is not that we sin and we're forgiven, but we sin, we're forgiven, and we live in the same spirit of forgiveness to the others. There is a power of Christianity. Um, so it's true character of forgiveness, right? let me read that last line. As we end tonight, let me read that. We do not only contain to ourselves the forgiveness, but live according to what we receive from uh, received by forgiving others and seeking forgiveness from others. Um, because we're forgiven, we live like the one who's forgiven. And by being forgiven, we also forgive others and we also seek for forgiveness from others. That is the power of forgiveness. So I just want to uh, invite you to prayer as an end. Um, if you could think of anyone that you have done wrong, if you could think of anyone that you should forgive, um, why don't we think of Jesus tonight, right? The story of David, how the son of David died in replacement of David, how Jesus died in our place uh, to give us that forgiveness because he wanted us to live in the same spirit of forgiveness, to forgive others, and to seek for forgiveness if we have done anything wrong to the others. Right? Uh, it's not a shameful act. Uh, we don't need to be shy about it. It is because there is a power. There's, that's just a character of, of the forgiveness, right? Uh, just as we are, just as we are, we come to God, and we come to the others without any shames. To be right with them and to make peace with anyone. Okay, uh, any questions? Any comment as the end?